drops away. So the question is, which path is selected? Well, looking back at our, um, at our, at our uh, comparison algorithm here, or our route decision algorithm, uh, weight of preference, I'm not even showing it to you, and they're, they're null. Uh, BGP local pref is equal, default value of 100. Uh, AS path length is, is uh, three hops. Uh, origin code is internal, metric. Everything is even eBGP, IGP, IGP metric, it's a local hop. Everything is equal. Um, in this case, it went down to, what did I show you? It went down to oldest route tiebreaker. So it happened to be, um, if you brought up the session to AS2 first, that becomes the active path. Then you bring up the session to AS3. I think in this it was the opposite. Um, and what ends up happening is uh, in, uh, in some routing link, well, in most routers, what they'll do is they'll come in and they'll say, well, I have an equal cost route. There's no compelling reason to select this. I'm not going to bother rewriting, uh, updating my rib or my fib because I already have an active route and this is not, this is not superior in any way. What ends up happening is um, if you have a maintenance or a flap, it's going to cause a shift. What that really means is you might be routing, you might be routing this, this path to, uh, to uh, AS2 for three months, and it's fine, and your balance is fine. And then AS2 has a maintenance where they take down their BGP session at midnight, and they bring it back up at midnight 06. And the next morning at peak, you realize that your AS2 traffic dropped significantly. AS3 traffic just shot up. Well, that's because the route went away off AS2. AS3 became the active route. When, the, when AS2 came back, he, again, he had a route that wasn't superior. He didn't actually update the forwarding table. So, so you're going to get flaps based on upstream activity. And uh, I call that non-deterministic. You, you can't guarantee that, uh, that you're always going to be routing that way, all of the things being equal. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting there. Yeah. Um, but thank you. Um, the, um, the, uh, it comes a little bit later. Um, let's look at the attributes of interest. So the, the, the three blue attributes, I'm calling them the attributes of interest. Uh, BGP local pref. That's something you've set um, within your local ASN. And it's only shared within IBGP neighbors and Confederate members as well. But I'm talking about simple networks here. Um, AS path length, that's the number of ASNs that need to be traversed to reach your target. Um, it's also known as the hop count. Um, there's a little hand on my thing. Um, this is the, uh, uh, this is, uh, the path uh, used to reach the, uh, the target. And all BGP speakers across the internet share it. It's, it's the mandatory attribute. Everyone tax on their ASN. Um, and uh, uh, Felix isn't out there. That's that's yeah. That's coming up later too. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, um, yeah. So the so the comment was about about multipath decisions. Uh, there are multipath options available. Um, it, it varies based on vendor. Sometimes it's off completely. Sometimes it can be turned on. It's, it gets interesting. Uh, that's a, an advanced slide towards the end I'm going to tell you about. Um, in this case, uh, we want to try to do something um, a little bit more sophisticated than uh, just 50-50 uh, load balancing multipathing. But it's an option. I'll show you as an alternate. Um, the origin code. So the origin code is interesting only because it actually interferes with what we call the metric system. We're actually going to end up disregarding the attribute. But it needs to be noted that it's, it's inspected here before the metrics. Um, BGP origin has three possible values, in, internal, exterior, oh, sorry, internal, external, or unknown. And then, of course, uh, the med. So med describes what's called the cost to the destination. It's shared, um, it, it, uh, it can be shared with any BGP and IBGP. Oftentimes, it really only has relevance with the local AS. It's, uh, uh, different, different ASNs will use uh, different scales to create MEDs. Some ISPs may use um, fiber kilometers uh, between hops. Some may use um, bandwidth based 10 giggy versus 1 giggy versus 40 giggy. Uh, some may not use it at all. Um, and for many ISPs, um, they will not even share a MED with you. Uh, typically, you turn up a BGP session, you'll find all the MEDs are null, and you're resetting them to zero. Uh, so typically, uh, ISPs may not even share them with you, or they'll just reset them all to zeros or reset them all to some flat value. Um, before they hand it off to the customer. So local pref, default value is 100, and it is a preference type. So higher number for preference is better. The, uh, oftentimes, it's the only way uh, most novices will do traffic engineering. It's pretty easy. It's there. You turn it on, and it works. Uh, you don't have to worry about anything lower down in the decision tree. It's usually the first thing, and it, it actually does work. Um, but I believe uh, it's, uh, it's not the best way to do the job. It's a heavy hammer. So once you just make a decision based on local pref, you don't look at any other attribute. And, uh, and you're ignoring some of the other rich data that's available to you to make uh, better decisions, um, uh, especially AS path link. I'll get to AS path link in a moment here. 
Uh, I think it should only be the last user, the last resort. If the metric system isn't working for you, or if you need to cost out a link, so you say this ISP, if they're having problems, they're going for maintenance, I want to take them out of service. Uh, you set all your routes from that ISP to local pref 5, just drop them and don't use them. It's better than turning off the BGP session, turning off the interface. Just set them down to five, you'll you know, send them five packets per second, um, and they can do whatever they want without impacting you. So one example of how, to, of how, we, how we can use local pref. So looking at the route uh, to uh, 1004. So 1004 uh, normally will have an equal cost, uh, an equal hop count, AS14 or AS24. And if we want to make sure that we're only using AS2 to get to 1004, we can simply set a local pref of 200. Uh, the higher number is better, so he'll overwrite the local pref of 100. Um, oh, l l let me rephrase that. This is not what we're doing. We're actually using local pref to override a shorter hop. Uh, 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 to shorter hop. So we could be using AS1 or 2 to get to, to 10.04. It's only two hops away, but for whatever reason, we actually want to send a longer path, 3, 5, 4. We want to send it 3 AS hops away. So in this case, when we learn 10.04 from our ISP AS3, we'll set that local pref to 200. Um, he'll share it with his neighbor, and uh, both routers will select uh, the longer path, 3, 5, 4, because local pref is higher. For AS path length, uh, this is a count type, so the lower count, the better. The less number of networks you have to traverse, the better. Typically, but not always, less, less ASN hops just logically means better performance. I don't have to go through five networks. It's less points of contention, less points of failure, less possibility for a congested peering point, uh, uh, some kooky route policy. Um, this is really the only universal indicator of anything near uh, path quality that we have on the internet. Uh, it's not perfect. Uh, it's, it's, it's all we got. But uh, generally, you can say, maybe nine times out of 10 or seven times out of 10, you know, less AS hops is a better path. Um, I, I like it as the first selection criteria. So first, choose the shortest path. Start that way. And then we go down and we use metrics to do some tweaks. As a bonus, some networks will use AS prepens. Um, remote ASNs will use prepens to try to hint to you that I, I don't want you to use this path to get to me. Show you an example of a. Uh, AS path selection, very simple, the path to AS5. Uh, path to AS5, if we just uh, have a vanilla routing table, it's two hops away using AS3, and it's three hops away using AS's one or two. And we will s naturally choose AS3 because it's a shorter path. And that way we don't have to contend with things like the link between AS4 and 5, uh, or a link between AS1 and 4. Um, as an example of prepens, let's say uh, looking for a uh, uh, 1004 over here, let's say AS4 has a congesting link to AS2. Let's, or let's say they have a 1 gig to AS2 and a 10 gig to AS1. They want to tell people on the internet, I prefer to take inbound traffic by AS1. So they're going to send a prepend and hopefully influence enough people to use AS2 less often than AS1. Well, me personally, I want to accept that. I want to listen to what people are trying to tell me because usually that means better performance for my, for my end users. So by them prepending, in this case they're sending two extra prepends, you see the path here looks like 2, 4, 4, 4. That's four hops. Comparing to, through AS1, 1, 4, which is two hops. So I'm going to naturally choose two hops versus four hops. I personally like that. If we were to do an override with local pref, for example, we would lose, we would lose this visibility because local pref is uh, inspected before AS hop count. Uh, next attribute of interest, uh, which is really, the, uh, 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 really part of the key here, is called, uh, it's called the MET. Uh, I'm going to call it BGP metric. Um, it's a uh, the default value is actually null. Uh, it's uh, uh, which turns into which by default will turn into zero on some platforms, um, although not on all platforms. And there are some ways to tweak that. I'll get in that a little, a little bit later. Uh, it was called a med because it's called it's med stands for multi exit discriminator, and it was initially used as a way for one I, two ASNs that are communicating with multiple links to each other, for one ASN to tell the other guy, I prefer that you send me traffic this way. And in some, time, in some cases, you can affect what's called cold potato routing. So maybe a longer, um, a longer path for your neighboring ASN. Um, but if you have a certain type of relationship where uh, they'll accept that information from you, you can help influence how they send traffic to you. Um, historically, uh, it, historically, metric was really only consulted if, if it's the same uh, destination ASN. So if, I'll show you this in the slide in a moment, uh, the historical use of med. In, uh, in show IP, PG, uh, show IP uh, BGP uh, and show route terse uh, output, it shows up as, as metric, and so we call it metric. Uh, it's really the key to the metric system. We're using metrics as a way to break ties between diverse ASNs. 
uh, and, uh, when we have um, um, the same number of AS hop counts. Here's historic use of MED. So uh, AS1 and AS2 have multiple connections to each other. AS, someone in AS1 is trying to communicate with 1002. Um, they might, uh, AS1 has to make a decision. He has two possible paths. Well, if AS2 sends a MED of 10 in this direction and a MED of 1 in this direction, AS1 will, all other things being equal, will actually select this path to AS2, provided that his routing policy accepts MEDs and he's willing to do cold potato routing. But this is what MED was, this is what MED was originally designed for. Um, it turns out that uh, this is, this is rarely, uh, rarely used, to my knowledge. Um, uh, people do prefer hot potato routing because it, it, it helps control costs and it helps control capacity. Um, uh, this is something that a content network can do uh, for inbound uh, traffic engineering, can send meds to their ISPs if they have multiple uplinks. But I'm not going to talk about that too much more. Um, let me show how we use metrics in the metric system. So in this case, you'll see on the previous slides, metrics were all uh, set at zero. In this case, uh, we're now actually setting metrics when we're learning routes. So looking at the path to AS6, or sorry, to 1006, there are three equal cost paths as far as hop counts go. 146, 246, 356. Well, how will I select which one to go? Well, if I'm setting all routes learned from AS1 with a metric of 100, AS2 with a metric of 200, and AS3 with a metric of 300, AS1 is going to be the selected path because he's the lowest metric. And that really is the key to the metric system. If I had 15 minutes to give my show, I would stop now and you'd understand it. I have some more time to fill. I'm going to show you some uh, interesting examples and even a couple of real-world cases. Um, before I move forward, though, I want to talk about the origin code one more time. Origin code initially was supposed to hint to BGP speakers how the route entered the BGP table. Uh, and it has the three values, internal, meaning it came from another BGP process, external, meaning it was uh, redistributed or injected from a different routing process. Um, unknown, I guess, captures all the other situations. Um, it's not really used consistently on the internet. Uh, I, I pulled three examples from three uh, default-free uh, uh, carriers. Um, one major U.S. carrier, zero routes were flagged with exter external or unknown. Um, I learned through the rumor mill they're just rewriting them all to internal because they don't want to have to deal with this. Um, another, another ISP, this is, this is looking at, a, at the full table, 267,000 routes. Another ISP had about 1,300 as external. Uh, 22,000, uh, 22,900, unknown, so it's 0.5% of the table and 8.5. Um, another carrier had 1.5 of his table set to external um, and uh, a, a, about 8.2 set to unknown. Uh, since the use is pretty arbitrary and since at least one major carrier uh, doesn't even use this value at all, uh, I'm, I feel pretty comfortable to say uh, for my purposes it's just safe to ignore. Not that much to, uh, not that much to do with uh, uh, origin code. Um, and then a reminder why we need to fix it. I told you the key to the metric system is to compare this value here, this metric. Well, BGP origin code um, it has, a, has a hierarchy where internal is selected above external and external is selected above unknown. <laughs> if, you, if you have an ISP here which is setting all routes set as internal, and an ISP here which has 22,000 as unknown, he might unfairly get some routes selected uh, simply because he, doesn't have, uh, he has the benefit of not having to go through the origin um, attribute uh, Comparison. Um, so uh, we simply uh, get rid of it uh, by just forcing everything to uh, internal, and therefore we don't have to worry about it. And metric passed, uh, metric based uh, determination will be available for us uh, consistently on all routes. Showing you uh, one more example here of how origin can interfere. So let's take, uh, let's say we go back to our previous example where we set, uh, we're looking to 1006, and we thought we were going to be smart. And again, we set everything from AS1 to 100, AS2 to 200, and AS3 to 300. And we're expecting AS6 to actually take AS1 as a path. Well, it turns out that AS, AS2 happens to be one of those ISPs that resets everything to internal. And AS1 happened to put an external flag on this route. Well, he's not going to get selected. AS2 is going to get selected despite having the more expensive metric. Uh, had we reset this to internal? Uh, the, metric would be, um, the metric would be compared, and uh, the lower metric of 100 would, of course, win. So introducing the metric system, what does it take? How do you do it? Well, first of all, our goals are we want to save costs. We want to ensure that your commits are met. We then want to ensure, of course, that your overage is going to your less expensive ISP. Let's say you have a pair of giggy links. You have 500 meg commits on each. You first send your first 500 megs, balance on each. If you have an extra 200 megs, you want to send it to your lowest ISP. And you can use, uh, you can use the metric system to help tune and tweak that. 
um, you want to improve performance. Uh, typically, less ASN hops means better performance. In some cases, you might want to override that. Um, that, uh, that doesn't fall within the metric system. It's a, a little override method that I'll show you a little bit later. But, uh, but typically, um, uh, typically that'll help um, for a majority of your internet users. This delivers, as I said, predictable and consistent results. Um, uh, where if your balance is working today, you have an ISP maintenance overnight, tomorrow your balance will be the same. Uh, or at least will not be affected by the ISP maintenance. Now, things do change on the internet. We'll get to that a little bit later. Um, so you do need to actually uh, keep watching. Um, but uh, as long as there's no major shift going out further along on the internet, uh, you, you will see fairly consistent uh, network results and, and load balancing. Um, uh, goes back to being deterministic and not, sh not uh, subjected to the arbitrary shifts. Uh, I found it's actually pretty easy to administer. It's minimal work, uh, minimal engineer time. It's not quite set it and forget it, but I, don't, but I haven't found you have to play with it every day. Maybe once a month at most you have to tweak it if there are major shifts in your traffic. In some cases, if you have a pretty steady traffic flow, maybe you touch it once every three months and you get to go on and do other fun things like firewall rules and spanning tree loop mitigations. Um, I think, again, more bang for your buck. It keeps your policies nice and short, nice and brief. You don't have to have thousands of lines of policies and all sorts of ASN references and local pref and hierarchical schemes that are very hard for other people to, to follow. It also will help uh, other engineers uh, learn the system and more people uh, make it more, maintain I mean, more maintainable support system. And of course, multi-vendor support. Um, nothing that I'm talking about is using a proprietary value that isn't available with all of the major uh, hardware vendors uh, that might carry a full BGP table. Um, as, uh, as Nathan reminded me, one of the reasons why you, you want to, uh, you want to stick, stick with your commits, of course, to avoid getting double build 90th percentile. If you shift, if you run, uh, if you have two 500 meg commits again on gigies and you're running 300, 800 one day and 800, 300 the other day and you keep flip-flopping, you'll actually end up paying for 800 plus 800 for both of your ISPs. You'll actually pay uh, artificial overages. You want to, you, you want to prevent that. Um, so you're sold. You like it. You want to do it. What's next? Um, there's some preparation. Uh, you you got you to get some cleanup going. You got to put your network back to a uh, um, uh, base configuration. Um, you're going to work on some tiebreakers. And then there's some additional tweaks. Maybe necessary, optional. You might find that you get what you want uh, just with a few uh, simple steps. So let's talk about the preparation steps. So a few prerequisites. Uh, to make your life easier, uh, your routers um, should have uh, enough RAM to hold multiple full BGP tables. Uh, some vendors, this is called software configuration. You want, to be, you want to be able to hold um, um, the entire routing information base you hear from your ISP in RAM uh, before you've subjected it to any of your policies so that you can more quickly make changes. Um, this, this will also work if you have abbreviated tables. Uh, last night I gave a talk about uh, how, to, how to run BGP uh, if your device can't support over 256,000 routes. Um, if you're using that system, this will still work for you. It'll work very well on 200,000 routes um, as well as 267, which was as of last week. Um, your cost of capacity or your transport is, isn't considered in the system. Um, so usually your WAN backhaul is, uh, is um, uh, we'll, we'll mess with this a little bit, meaning if, if you have, um, if you have a, a network, if you have a link in Los Angeles and a link in San Francisco and you're sharing a transit, you're backhauling between them, if you have to take that cost of that WAN link or capacity into account, um, this doesn't work very well. Uh, what, we, what I usually recommend is chop that into two transit islands and try to limit the amount of backhaul. On the, on the other hand, if you have a tremendous amount of backhaul or you're within a, region, region, uh, within a metro region, you have a lot of dark fiber, lots of overcapacity built link sunk cost, you don't care if you're using 5 megabit or 100 megabit, um, this actually works very cleanly. So try to, do, try to divide your network into transit islands where the backhaul component uh, from router to router um, isn't a cost consideration. Two routers in the same data center usually not a cost because what's the backhaul? Well, it's a port cost and a physical wire between them and it's fairly inexpensive to add more wires if you have to. Um, also, network, uh, networking, staff that, uh, networking staff that run the system are going to want to stay involved in Nanog, Aaron, if you're not in North America, in RIPE, APNIC, etc. Um, uh, you're going to want to be in the know. You're going to want to keep, uh, keep your ear to the ground uh, of things that are going on, major ISP changes, acquisitions, AS number consolidation, uh, uh, backbone additions, uh, because uh, those, those types of things will, of course, change your traffic shift and you're going to want to accommodate. Let's talk about preparation. So if you're not already getting the full internet table, if you're just getting quad zeros from your ISPs, uh, you're not quite ready yet. You're going to want to go ahead and get that full table. You should get communities while you're at it from your ISPs. Uh, most major ISPs do use communities. Um, go ahead and ask for them, and they should give them to you. Uh, some clueless, uh, uh, less clueful ISPs, especially their typical support staff, which are resetting email passwords, 
and uh, kicking DHCP servers might not know, so you might have to ask a few times. Now, along with communities, get the community definitions. This is very important. Um, it can sometimes be a challenge. I'll talk about it in a moment. Uh, but but you've got to get those definitions. Um, you want to configure uh, MED comparison across diverse next hops ASNs. As I said, by, uh, by default, uh, MED is uh, only inspected if the, um, if the next hop ASN is actually the same. You want to turn on soft reconfiguration inbound if your hardware supports it. Uh, this will uh, help you make changes a little more rapidly, a little more gracefully. Uh, identify the best time to make your changes. Schedule windows if necessary. Uh, this is not something that you typically will just do one time between 3 and 4 a.m. You might want to actually find a recurring window where you can make these changes. Um, and of course, you need to clean up and unify your current policy before you can actually move on to the system. Let's talk about communities a little bit more. So community tags, it's an additional attribute that gets carried along with a route. A route is typically 1006, and here's the next hop. Well, there's extra information that can be shared, um, and, uh, and it provides useful information about what the route is. So it can be, what kind of route is this? Is this learned from a peer and from a customer? Where is it learned? Is it learned in North America? Is it learned in Europe? Is it learned in Amsterdam? Learned in Los Angeles? Um, pretty much all reputable ISPs are using community tags internally. Uh, they, they need that information in order to help them do troubleshooting and make decisions and do their own load balancing when necessary. Uh, most of them will not send communities to the downstream by default. So, uh, but they will do it on request. And if you, if you have an ISP that won't do it on request, find out when your contract expiration date is and find a new ISP. And before you sign, make sure that they'll actually give you communities and not charge you extra for it. Um, there's no standard format for communities. Um, which is why I say get the definitions. They're otherwise a pretty useless. What does community 444 mean from one ISP and what does 777 mean from another ISP? Um, there are a couple RFCs that recommend, uh, that make recommendations, um, but um, in my experience um, uh, across, uh, across six larger ISPs, uh, everyone has uh, decided their own scheme um, and, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, there's no universal standard. I'll show you a couple examples here. Um, uh, let's say a route that's learned from a customer in Los Angeles. Just two examples that I happen to pull off my tables here. Um, end layer, we use kind of a compound community scheme, which is kind of nice because I guess technically speaking it saves RAM and, uh, and it makes you feel like a more sophisticated engineer because you can do interesting regex, uh, regex games. Uh, end layer will send this community along with that route and that will tell you it's a customer in Los Angeles. Level three will send a few communities saying, well, this is a customer, this is um, uh, I'm not going to pretend I remember. I think this is Los Angeles. I think this is, I think this is uh, maybe region, and that's, uh, that's country. I don't exactly even, I don't remember off the top of my head. I do the 1, 2, 3 as a customer, of course. Uh, if you, a route is learned from a private peer in Amsterdam, again, end layer will send a completely different community. At level 3, we'll send different sets of communities, one telling you that that's a peer, and then a region, city, uh, pop, look, pop location. Um, the reason I'm telling, talking about communities now is you may have to refer, to refer them later for finer tuning. So go ahead and get them before you start. Um, you may never use them at all. Uh, you may use them sometimes. Um, if if uh, you need to look for definitions, um, there's uh, uh, some ISPs publish them on their website. So for example, here's the link to NLayer. Publish their community, a nice concise one-sheeter. Um, uh, fairly easy to follow. If, uh, you might need to read a couple times if you've never done it before. Uh, some ISPs will publish it in their routing registry entry. So level three, for example, uh, publishes it as a, as a large, very large description field. They have a very rich community set, very large description field in their routing registry. Um, some ISPs won't publish it publicly because they consider it proprietary and secretive. Um, ask their support staff. A lot of support staff might uh, shy away from that, saying, oh, I can't share that with you. That's internal. Ask your sales engineer. Most of your sales engineers are clueful enough Say, oh, of course I can give that to you, no problem. Um, our friends over at 1SC uh, have a, uh, an unofficial collection that, uh, that they've put together over the years. Um, uh, this is also a good place to start uh, while you're waiting for your sales engineer sales or, or support staff to get you something. Go ahead and take a look over here. Um, if you find something's missing over here, go ahead and contribute. Send an email over to those guys and say, hey, um, I have some more communities for you that you haven't yet published. And uh, they'll put them up there. Um, let me show what a base configuration looks like. So uh, in, in the Cisco world, uh, base configuration starts with uh, router BGP and your, your AS number. You need to turn on this metric comparison for diverse ASNs. And that's very simple. You just say BGP always compare med. Um, put the safety net on, just in case you, uh, there's a missing metric. Some route leaked through your policy. You, uh, you, started a route, you started a route map and you forgot to put a match statement. Um, best path, what's called missing, uh, med missing is worse. But by default, no metric coming in. In, on Cisco will turn into a metric of zero, which is the best lowest possible value. 
Um, this will set any missing metric to 4.2 billion, uh, which is the worst possible value, and it won't actually it won't won't accidentally be selected until you can finish writing your route map policy. Um, turn on your soft reconfiguration, soft reconfiguration inbound, so that you're storing uh, storing all the routes in uh, in RAM. And um, in Cisco, for uh, legacy reasons, they store communities in these just you know long long uh, integer strings. Um, turn on BGP community new format because what the hell everybody else does it by default, and it's a lot easier to read. Um, uh, this is outside of the BGP uh, configuration. That's it's it's back dented one. Um, in uh, in Foundry, a couple similar tweaks. You go into BGP configuration mode. You turn on always compare med. You turn on missing is worse, and you turn on soft reconfiguration. In Force 10, go to your BGP. You need the AS number in Force 10. You turn on always compare med. You turn on soft reconfiguration inbound. Interesting. Uh, Force 10 decided to treat missing meds as worse by default. Um, and uh, something I actually forgot about, but I found while I was doing the slides. So you don't actually have to turn that on. For a Juniper, um, pretty simple. In your, in the, in your global uh, BGP configuration, you turn on path selection, always compare med. Soft reconfiguration is enabled by default. I believe it's always on. I don't think you can actually turn it off, which is good. I don't know why I'd want to turn it off unless I was RAM starved, in which case I need a better router. Um, uh, Missing med is worst. I couldn't find a way to turn that on in Juniper. Um, if there is, uh, tell me afterwards, and I'll add it to the slides before we publish them. Um, you can write a policy that does that. Yeah, uh, this is, I'm talking about global BGP configuration. Yeah, I'm talking about like the one, the one base configuration. Yeah, definitely can do it in policies. Uh, th what, what this, is, this is to protect against if you have a typographic error, typographical error in your policy. So it's a safety net in case you fuck up your policy, basically. So. So your base configuration, you want to push this to all of your routers. Absolutely. The same thing with changing administrative distance on a, on a protocol. Uh, this is something you definitely want to do universally um, uh, across your infrastructure. Thank you, uh, Nina. Um, and then you would identify time. So when you're, when you're doing traffic balancing, generally uh, you're, tra you're, you're balancing your peak periods because uh, that's the most important. That's when you get into trouble. So identify your peak periods. Look at your past, your past your daily graphs, your weekly, monthly graphs, and identify are you peaking at 4 p.m., at 7 p.m., at midnight, um, are you serving porn, in which case you actually uh, are peaking twice? You have this extra um, wanking hour, as Raz likes to call it, um, which, by the way, is universal. If any of you uh, uh, serve, uh, serve porn up, take a look at your graphs. There's that extra peak at the end of the night. Um, uh, that is universal. Um, uh, when you, once you find your time, prepare your management and operations staff. Let them know you are going to be make cha making changes during peak periods. This, this sometimes is a hard sell. Um, so you might have to actually try it out a couple times just to prove that you can do it without breaking things. Um, but let people know that you are going to be making shifts during these times. Sometimes when you make a shift, it might cause temporary congestion. Uh, so people need to be prepared. In general, what I'm, the kind of changes I'm talking about are pretty soft, uh, pretty elegant, and unless you're congesting link, will not cause, uh, will not cause any noticeable outages. Uh, the one exception to that is if you happen to be shifting traffic to an inferior path, um, uh, to, to, an, uh, to an inferior path to your destination, well, those customers might end up suffering. Well, that's not, that's not directly related to a change you made. If, one of, if your better ISP went away, you'd be shift, they'd be shifted anyway. Um, so just, just prepare, prepare your people and, uh, and get buy-off. If you don't get buy-off on this, um, I, I would say get that resume on dice.com and go find another job because you're not going to be able to be effective here. Um, the next preparation step is a cleanup. You're going to clean up those policies. So you're going to scrub in for surgery. surgery. You're going to take out all of your old policies. And again, universally, you're going to do this. And you're going to put in, just for starters, a catch-all policy. It does nothing but accept every route, reset that origin to internal, reset that metric to zero, and sit back and watch, see what's going on. Um, and once, once you have that across the board, and you have the earlier uh, base configurations, you're ready to proceed. A uh, quick note, the remaining examples, in the interest of slides and my own sanity, I'm just going to be showing you Cisco and Juniper moving forwards. Uh, Foundry and Force 10s are very similar, although they do have their own tweaks. Please consult your manuals, RTFM, et cetera, et cetera, um, before you try to apply a Cisco configuration to a Foundry and Force 10. Um, I, I'm sorry if I've left out any other major uh, full-table BGP hardware vendors. Uh, these are the four that I've found I work most with. Um, and if there are ones that you work most with, I'm sure you can adapt this information to that hardware. Um, there are many ways to write routing policies here. There's very many styles to do it in, especially when you talk about Juniper. Uh, there's so many ways where you can do 
um, you know, next policies and embedded policies. I'm showing you a pretty simple way. Uh, if you have another way to do it in your company, look for that precedence and try to stick with that. You don't want to cons confuse other people. You don't want to make it harder for the new guy coming up who sees five different styles of routing policies. So um, you don't have to copy uh, the way I wrote it. You can feel free to apply your own style to it as long as the results are the same. Um, here's the way a base policy looks like. This is the scrubbing policy I was talking about. Very simple. You have one route map statement. I gave it a, a high, high stanza number because this is always going to be the very last stanza. And I gave it 1,000. We're going to inject stanzas up above it with lower numbers. Uh, if you don't recall, Cisco, uh, um, Cisco um, evaluates uh, route maps in, in, the order, uh, in uh, increasing numerical order from the stanza number. So here I put a little description saying it's a catch-all. There's no match statement, which means he's going to just match everything. He sets his metrics to zero. He rewrites his origin to IGP. You're done. You simply apply to a neighbor by saying, neighbor, peer IP, route map, route maps in from ISP1 in. Obviously, for ISP2, you'd call it ISP2. And usually, you'd actually name your ISP. Um, but in this case, our name is ISP1. Uh, in Junos, uh, also uh, fairly clean to do. Um, uh, I prefer to do it uh, using multiple policies. So I set one policy. It's just called set route origin IGP, uh, set route origin. And all he does, again, there's no, um, there's no from statement, so he matches all routes. And he just resets origin IGP, and he moves on to the next policy. Applying that here, you say you apply this policy first. So every route gets sent through this policy first, and then just goes to the next one. Import from ISP1 is where we're actually going to be doing most of our work. Here we have a term called catch-all, which we'll always keep at the end. Again, there's no, there's no from statement, so he matches all routes, rewrites metric to zero, and accepts the route. So those are the base configurations. Let's talk about how to actually do metric system configurations. How do you make this happen? How does the magic, how does the magic happen? So once you did your preparations, we're ready to go. There are a few stages here. Um, the first stage is equalizing the playing field. In, this, is, this is rare. Uh, in, some cases, um, in some cases, you might need to add some AS path prepend, prepend some interesting cases I'm going to show you. Um, we've already fixed the route attri origin attributes, so that equalized uh, that, that playing field. Um, and uh, so you might find you might not even need to go through the first stage. The second stages are your easy, simple, broad strokes. This is the bang for your buck. You start by setting your tiebreakers. Then you may, you may have to do some general selection based on information you get from ISP, for example, community tags. Your third stage, if necessary, is uh, looking at specific destination networks. If you find you need to do additional tweaks, you might have to focus on some destination networks. Uh, in this case, you need to actually start to understand what those are. Um, this is where flow-based is statistics gets more, uh, more important to have. And um, I say when you're doing destination networks, do destination ASNs a little bit better than destination prefixes. If you have to do fine-tuning, that's where you start to get into destination prefixes. Um, uh, in, again, in, uh, in, in my experience, uh, we rarely uh, go down into the third and fourth, final stages. We can usually get most of our job done based on broad strokes. Um, typically, you get diminishing margin of return down here. I can spend seven hours trying to tweak a destination network to save you 50, 50 bucks a month. I charge a lot more than 50 bucks an hour, so that's not a good idea for you. Um, so going back to our sequence of events, first stage, equalizing the playing field. As we said, we already fixed the route origin attribute during the cleanup, but um, I, I just can't mention enough because if you miss it, it's going to get you, and you're going to hate yourself for it. Um, now, does one of our ISPs inject another local ASN before you get to the backbone ASN? Um, th this occurs, um, there, there are a couple ISPs that, uh, that have regional, uh, regional ASNs for every metro pop, and they all connect to the backbone ASN before they get you on the internet. Um, uh, it works for them for various purposes, but it might make them look like an inferior route, artificially inferior route, and we, we don't want them to suffer because of that. Um, um, the, um, uh, and I'll, so, what's that? Yeah, artificially. So, um, so to fix that, we actually pad all other ISPs by adding another uh, ASN in there, and then everybody gets equalized. I'll show you that in a moment in the diagram. Um, once you've equalized it, take your baseline measurements of your traffic levels. Maybe let it run for 24 hours. Maybe let it run for seven days, depending on the, uh, uh, the nature of your network. Uh, get those numbers uh, steady and know what the numbers are before so you can see how effectively you've shifted them. Uh, this is what that looks like, that ASN. So let's say AS1 over here, uh, that's their actual backbone ASN. And you happen to be in a metro region where, uh, where all of the routers in that region are, are called AS7. So you as a customer are connecting to AS7. Of course, before you can get any further, you always go through AS1. So what ends up happening here, looking, for example, to, uh, <clears throat> at the path to uh, 10.1, in fact, you'll find that it appears that AS1 and AS2 both have two hops to get to 10.0.1. But you, you're a little smarter than that. You know you definitely want to take this path. That's much better. So what you're going to do is you're going to go ahead and you're going <clears> to <throat> 
you're going to pad information you hear from AS2 and AS3. You're going to add another copy of their AS in the path. So now this path to 1001, um, taking, taking this uplink here will look like AS7 and AS1. But now taking this path will look like AS2, AS2, and AS1. That's down here. And over here, AS3, AS3, and 541, you're never going to use that path, obviously. Um, uh, that's a, something simple you can do. You do it, uh, <clears throat> you do it ba uh, uh, back on your catch-all policy. Um, again, rare, rare, but it's, it's, it's real. Um, so just uh, know about it. Uh, once we've equalized the playing field, our next sequence of events is our broad strokes. The most bang for your buck. Basically what it comes down to is your tiebreakers. Your tiebreakers is probably the one most complicated, uh, one most complicated piece of balancing you're going to have to do to figure out. Um, and uh, you might find you're done there. So there's a really good, uh, 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 there's a really good win there. You spend some time, in, you invest some time in your tiebreakers, and afterwards you uh, go out and get a beer. Sometimes you might need to do some uh, general selection based on community tags. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, you're, uh, so where you start is you set a different metric value for each ISP on the catch-all route policy. Um, experiment with different sequences. Uh, again, I'll show you some pictures here, but experiment with different, different sequences of who's going to win ties over who. Does AS1 win over 2? Does AS2 win over 3? Who wins overall when there's an equal tie? Uh, take a measurement each way. You may have to set it one way during peak periods, and maybe within 30 minutes you'll know if you were successful or not. You may have to let it run for 24 hours, 7 days, etc. Um, take a measurement each step of the way, so afterwards you can go back and decide which was the most effective. Uh, decide on your final tiebreaker that most closely meets your goals. Uh, again, you may have it done. You may be so close and need one extra tweak. So find the best match and stick with it. Uh, and if your breakers aren't enough, you have to actually move to community-based uh, decisions. Um, and you might find after tiebreakers in a couple communities, you may be done. Uh, this is what an AS path tie looks like. So looking at the path back to 1006, you have um, equal AS path 146, 246, 356. Uh, by default, or even with our catch-alls now, because we've already done some cleanup, our metrics are all zero, our local prefs are all equalized at 100, and the vehicle pass, well, who, who do we select? Uh, as I said, uh, it really depends on your, uh, uh, it depends on what hardware you're running. You might have different methods of selecting ties. It depends on oldest route. But we're going to do away with that. We're going to fix this so that it's always done the same way. So um, let's look, for example, first of all, when I call an ISP a tier, uh, it's a contentious term. Uh, it used to mean, uh, not it used to mean, the definition I use is a tier one. Uh, it typically buys, uh, 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 buys no transit uh, or minimal transit. Uh, it gets all of his, um, uh, gets all of his networks uh, via direct connections. Uh, it really means, uh, but, uh, more accurately, um, he has direct access to a significantly large number of ASNs. Uh, a lower tiered ISP um, usually will send much of his traffic to a single or, or two upstream ASNs, his transit providers, before he can actually proceed to the internet. So it really has to do for me with uh, the number uh, uh, next top AS reachability counts. How many ASNs can he reach directly? Or how many ASNs does he have to first hit a transit ASN before he can get to? Um, the, reason, the reason we talk about that is in the case here of, um, in the case here of, uh, of AS4, for example, um, in, in this model, AS1, 2, and 5 are the tier 1 ISPs, the transit freeze. And AS3 has to first send his traffic to a transit ISP before he get to AS4. Versus, whereas these guys have direct access to AS4. Um, but this just goes back into understanding your routing table. Um, you want to take poke at your routing table, take a look. Look at the differences. Um, if, you, if you can find your top five ASNs, see which direction they take. Um, see how many ties you have. Um, see how many, times, how many times you don't have a tie. How, how good are your ISPs to you? Um, go ahead and compare your performance measurements if you have performance tools. Um, or, or compare your, your traffic utilization, you know, your cacti, your MRTG, et cetera, um, at each step. Um, and uh, if you need to wait an hour, if you need to wait a week, wait however long you need to before you actually have reliable data. And if the first tie-breaking scheme doesn't work, flip it around. Try it again. Let me show you an example here. So in this, uh, in this situation, we set all routes from AS1 to 100 metric, all routes from AS2 to metric 200, all routes AS3 to 300. So let's look at a couple of these ties here. Um, for example, um, for example, ties to, well, the first two routes I'm showing you are just local connected, uh, 1001, 1002, 1003. Those are selecting for shortest path naturally uh, out AS1, AS2, or AS3. Uh, here's a tie here, 1014. You could be going by AS1 or 2, but you're selecting AS1 because of the 100 metric. Path here to AS5, uh, you're actually, uh, it's the highest metric, 300, 
but you're selecting the shortest path, 3, 5, versus 1, 4, 5, or 2, 4, 5. Uh, and then over here to AS6, where you have three equal AS paths, we're going to select the lowest metric, uh, and the traffic is going to go out via AS1. If that isn't good enough for you, flip around. Now AS1 is actually, uh, AS2 is now the tiebreaker. He has the lowest metric of 100. AS2 will win over, sorry, AS1 will win over AS3, and AS3 will lose all ties. Uh, in this case, uh, what changed around here is 1014 is now going out via AS2, and 1016 is going out via AS2 as well. Uh, if that's not good enough for you, flip it some more. Now AS3 wins all ties, AS2 loses all ties, and AS1 uh, wins ties over AS2, loses ties over AS3, um, and so on and so forth. You'll see now AS6 takes AS3 out, um, and, uh, um, um, and now 1014. Uh, uh, um, so what, what happened there, I have this note to remind me here, uh, what happens is 1014 uh, in this case went out AS2. Well, now that you flipped around, all you flipped around was AS2 and 3, because maybe you need to send a little more traffic to AS2 and 3. Watch what happens when you flip around AS2 and 3. Oh, look, AS4 just moved. Uh-oh. Well, let's make sure you wanted that to happen. So those are the kind of things you need to watch out for. Usually you don't need to watch this, this level of granularity. I'm kind of showing you on a micro level what happens on a macro level. But just take a look at your bandwidth. And your result is going to be not, oh, this route shift, but, oh, too much bandwidth to shift to AS1. I was trying to shift traffic to AS3, but I end up shifting it to AS1. And this, is, this shows an example of why that happens. The way you configure tiebreakers in Cisco um, is uh, that original catch-all policy where we set our metrics to zero just for starters. Now we take that and we set that catch-all policy to uh, a unique value. So uh, in, in our first slide, we said AS1 wills all, all ties, so he has a metric of 100, AS2 metric of 200, 300. Um, as a reminder, lowest metric, uh, <coughs> excuse me, lowest metric uh, wins. Um, so this, in this case, AS1 is winning. Um, and uh, then you just adjust that, uh, adjust that value accordingly. On Juniper, again, very similar. You're going to go back into your catch-all policy that you have with metric zero and go ahead and set those values. Um, I'm going to show you some actual numbers. I'm going to show you how effective this was, uh, what we were able to do with just tiebreakers. This is um, exemplary of an actual network. Um, so uh, in this case, we, had, uh, uh, we have three ISPs. This is a content hosting network. We have three ISPs um, of, of similar tiers uh, as, this, uh, as this diagram, two tier one ISPs, two transit free ISPs, and one ISP who, um, who ended up purchasing transit for a majority of his non peered internet routes. And we had a 10 gig link to each ISP, and we were trying to get a balance of about four, four, and two, uh, because our commit levels were about four and four to the tier one ISP, and about two gigabit per second to the tier three ISP. The tier three ISP also ended up being the least expensive, as would be expected. And in the first scheme, where we set, uh, where we set uh, uh, AS1 to be the tiebreaker, so at 100, 200, 300, we sat back, and look what happened to our bandwidth. We did 8.5 gig to AS1, 1.5 gig to AS2, and a trickle of bandwidth, 200 megabit to AS3. Well, that's, that's nowhere where we want it to be, obviously. Um, AS1 ended up taking a significant amount of traffic. AS1 and AS2 were very similarly connected to the eyeball network we were trying to get to. So by giving them all the tiebreakers, he just ended up slurping too much traffic away from AS2. So the first thing we did is we had to try to balance AS1 and 2. So we flipped it around. So AS1 got 200, AS2 got 100. So we just flipped the top two. And you see what ended up happening is that we definitely got a better balance between AS1 and 2, which is great. So we moved from 8.5 to 1.5 to 4.5, 5.5, pretty good. But AS3 still isn't going to need traffic. So we decided, you know, AS3 just isn't as well connected to as many ASNs. So let's give him a fighting chance when, uh, for all of the tied ASNs. So we flipped around just a little bit more. We fl uh, so now AS3 wins all the ties. He got his 2.7 gig of traffic, so he got his 2 and his overage. Um, AS2 got his 4 gig per second, which happened to be the commit. We're very happy. And AS1 got a little bit under commit. But at this point in time, it's, it's, um, it's one catch-all policy. We're very happy. Uh, and we're able to stop right here. Um, and, uh, and it persisted actually very well for quite a while uh, without any additional changes. Um, uh, no ASN, no prefix tweaks, didn't even look at communities. Um, and what was nice about this uh, scheme, although I didn't show you the, the failure mode, but um, when one ISP link went away, uh, we didn't end up with a congested link on the other side. Uh, in this first model, if AS2 went away, all that traffic would go to AS1, well, that, uh, that link would actually flatline. Um, in these models, when one link went away, um, in this model, one link went away, we actually, uh, AS3 took a little bit more traffic. 
In this model, we also would have seen congestion. AS2 goes away. AS1 would take all the traffic. Um, so this actually covered our failure scenarios very well uh, uh, as well. Um, and we were done, like I said, and uh, go on with our day. Um, as I said, in the you want to take a look at failure scenarios as well once you're done, saying, well, what, what will happen if one of my ISPs will go away? Am I going to end up with congestion? And if the answer is yes, well, then you haven't, done, uh, you haven't completed the work. Um, uh, I would say, if possible, schedule a test. Go ahead and take that link down. Don't just pull the wire, you know, maybe cost out BGP or something like that, uh, set a local pref of five. But uh, schedule a test and, and check it. And if it's not good enough, undo your change, fix it, and try it again. And maybe, if you're lucky, you can squeeze both of them in the same maintenance window. Um, the next broad stroke, if that's not sufficient, um, use, use communities. Sometimes, if the two ISPs are too similar, um, simply, uh, simply affecting tiebreakers uh, just isn't going to be sufficient. Um, like I said before in this example, um, um, eight, uh, just by shifting tiebreakers to AS1, if we only had these two ISPs, by shifting tiebreakers to AS1, he got way too much traffic. I needed to somehow take more traffic and give it AS2. In this network, by the way, if you flip around, you end up getting a 65-45 split. So you get 6.5 gig and 4.5, which still isn't good enough because you're way over on your other ISP. Um, so what do we end up doing in that situation? We use communities. Um, try to use broad community definitions to help the balance. Don't just look at oh, all the routes in Seattle. Maybe look at peer versus customer, customer versus transit, peer versus transit. Maybe look at a region, uh, North America, uh, uh, a continent. Um, or a, a, con a continent is North America. A region, uh, our uh, Western United States, our continent, North America. There we go. Uh, or maybe a country, all routes in Germany, routes to Amsterdam, routes to Europe, uh, to England, etc. Uh, UK. Um, here's an example of how to use community. So, uh, adding, adding to the slide, showing you the relationships between these links. Uh, let's uh, let's presume that uh, AS4 is a customer of AS1s. AS4 is a peer of AS2s. AS5 is a transit provider for AS3. AS3 is buying from AS5, and AS1 and 2 are peers. Uh, I'm giving you some, some faux customer communities. Um, if these bear any resemblance to actuals, I apologize. Um, AS1 decides he's going to fly customers with 100, peers with 200. AS2 is going to fly customers with 555, peers with 66. And AS3 is going to tra flag transits as 4,000. And they're there. They end up being this diverse. So you've got to keep... Uh, Keep a handle on those, uh, on those communities. Uh, us personally, when we actually get community information, uh, community definitions from the ISPs, we'll take them and archive them locally because um, we don't want to rely upon them becoming mysteriously unavailable when we, when we actually desperately need them. Um, so what we can do is um, we want to actually uh, affect a, um, uh, we want to affect uh, uh, customers. We want to take customers and make sure they go to AS1. So, so in the Cisco world, what we do is we make a, uh, you don't have to, I prefer to do it this way, make it using named list because you can reference the name and it reminds you what, what is this 1 colon 100. I make a named community list called AS1 customers and I put in there 1 100. And I make a, a community list called AS3 transit and I put in 3 4,000. And then in my policy, I just simply say match any routes with this community and go ahead and set a metric. In this case, I'm setting metric 50, which is better than anybody's tiebreaker because I want to actually affect, I want to make sure that all the customers, all things being equal, are going to end up going to AS1. Uh, similar thing for ISP3. I want to make sure I'm not sending ISP3 any transit routes. Um, maybe because I want to be nice and save them some money. Maybe because I figure um, you know, they're probably going to be skimmed out on their transit links and let it congest every now and then. So I'm going to take uh, their transit routes, which are tagged with 4,000. I'm going to give a metric 400, which is worse than any of the highest, uh, which is worse than the highest tiebreaker. So he will always lose unless it's the shortest AS hop. Um, uh, in uh, Junos, uh, fairly similar. You create a, uh, named, uh, a community named object, and you go ahead and you put a from, um, a from statement, which is like a match statement, um, and set your metric. Nice and simple. Um, and uh, let me show you when you would use this. So, so we, we go back to our base, which was uh, 100, 200, 300 for ASS 3, 2, and 1. And we say, you know what? I don't like this route. I don't like the fact that, um, that uh, 10, 1, 4 is going out AS2 because um, maybe this peering link gets congested frequently. And this is a real-world situation. This peering link, uh, it's taken them, they're trying to augment, it's taken them a month for some lame reason. Um, so I've got to make sure this traffic goes this way instead. I'm going to give them to a paying customer of AS1s as opposed to a peering link of AS2s. I also, I don't like this path. Um, I like everything else about AS3 being the tie winner because he, sent, he got all of his 2, two gig worth of traffic. But uh, this path is, is bad because this transit uplink 
maybe it gets congested. Or maybe I'm a friend of the AS3 guys, like, man, it's getting pricey. Can you, can you try to send me less transit traffic? Um, so I want to change these things. So what we're going to do is, um, based on the previous model, we're going to go ahead and say, well, okay, I'm going to prefer, prefer customers of AS1, and I'm going to depref customers of AS3. So what ends up happening? Well, we take these two routes we don't like, and lo and behold, we manage to change them. So now, AS1 got a metric of 50 for this path to AS4, and he's using them, selecting them as best. And then for AS3, we deprefed, he actually, um, AS3 got a metric of 400, which was higher than 100, and the metric of 200 was selected. And we managed to change those two. Um, and uh, doing things like customer versus transit, customer versus peer, you might actually shift just as much traffic. Um, but you know, you, there's some trial and error over here. There's, uh, there's definitely no, no set formula here. And it will vary from a ISP to ISP. Um, let me show you some more actual numbers. So we went back to our model here, where we had 3.5, 4.0 and 2.7. Well, it turns out we came back and we looked back at the contract and said, you know what? That, that ISP, we actually didn't have a 2 gig commit. I'm really sorry, it's embarrassing. We had a 1 gig commit. We need to shed some load here. Well, I already know I can't just do it by flipping metrics around. This is my best balance. But I need to get some traffic off of him. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to depref his transit, which is great. I end up deprefing his transit, but remember on AS2, I had a 4 gig commit. He was already at 4. I can't send it to AS2. So I need to send to AS1. So I'm going to pref AS1's customers. And sure enough, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing how successful this is with minimal steps. This is real world numbers. We managed to get this down to one meg, or near the one meg commit. And we got both these guys at minimum their four meg commit and just a little bit overage on AS1, which was perfectly fine. And again, we were done. We were able to move on with our day. Um, so if that's not good enough, there's the next, the next in sequence of events, we have uh, some destination network based balancing. If your broad strokes aren't working, your communities aren't working, uh, if you find that you have, um, uh, you have performance issues that, uh, that metrics just uh, aren't, aren't handling one specific network that you need to make sure he needs to go the other direction, again, all uh, a local pref uh, AS hop count being equal, um, um, you're going to want to start setting some destination networks. Most of the times, you're not going to need it. Um, if you do need it, it's a lot more demanding, it's a lot more time consuming. Diminishing margin of return, you're going to spend a lot more time, you're going to shift a lot less bandwidth. But if it means that your customers aren't complaining, <clears throat> frequently it's necessary. Usually by the time you get here, you're going to want to have flow-based data. You're going to want to know maybe your top 10, 20 ASNs. Because again, you're going to want to try to shift, if it's cost-based, you're going to want to shift the top ASN uh, um, to get more bang for your buck. You don't want to have to shift 15 ASNs when you can get it by just shifting two ASNs. So this is where you start getting into needing flow-based data. So far, by the way, we've done all this about flow-based data, which is really great for those of you who are like me who have had really bad experience with flow-based or don't have the time or money or hardware that can support it. Um, um, I recommend it's better to make changes based on des destination ASNs instead of specific IP, IP prefixes. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, very large ISPs might change a complete IP prefix block out, out from under you. It's less likely that they're going to change their AS number. More likely they're going to change their prefixes. Uh, um, over time, that's just historical observations. Um, that being said, they will also sometimes change ASNs, which is why I said earlier you need to keep your keep your ear to the ground on this uh, on the internet uh, uh, in the internet communities. So, show you an example here. Let's go back to um, uh, ten one six. So, um, so in our in our old model, uh, we have um, AS three deprefing transit. Uh, AS two wins over AS three, and we end up sending AS six out AS two. Well, let's say, um, let's say again that this peer link isn't behaving well. It's congesting and it's going to take a month to fix it. Um, we want to send this to AS1 now. We don't want to send it to AS2. So what do we do? Um, we, uh, we configure uh, uh, an access list in Cisco, which matches AS6. <clears throat> we put in uh, another statement here. This is not in our catch-all. This is higher than our catch-all. Saying, hey, match AS path number one, which has AS6 in there. Go ahead and drop your metric to 60. So I'm going to win over the tiebreaker. Uh, Junos, again, you make a uh, name-based object. You go ahead, you, whoa, that's a typo. Um, that's supposed to say from AS path. Um, you match the AS path, and you go ahead and you set your metric. Uh, what does that look like? Well, previously, uh, we were selecting 200, which was lower than 300. Now, it's set the metric of 50. And of course, we prefer the path through AS1. Some gotchas on the destination network. So overall, again, try to minimize this step. Focus on those broad strokes if you can do it. Just tweaking the balance of those metrics. Now, it gets more difficult with the, the more ISPs you have when you have four or five and you're doing five-way comparisons. 
Um, but try to get those try, try to get those going. In order to do this effectively, your network engineers really need to stay up to date. Um, the internet changes. Uh, ISP shift. People buy transit. They leave transit. They add peers. They remove peers. <clears throat> um, uh, for example, uh, some large eyeball uh, uh, backbone shifts that have happened over the past mm, two years that, that we can all, uh, you know, all, all remember, um, where they added ASNs, removed ASNs. Um, if uh, if you you want to also try to shift only one network at a time and try to reduce the number of networks that you have to manually tweak. If it's not enough or if it's too much, roll it back and shift another one. Um, and if you don't have useful flow data. Um, and you don't know how much traffic you're sending to each ASN, well, uh, another quick trick you can do, if you have a backup link, which is sending zero packets per second, or if you can configure for a brief period of time a link, which is sending zero packets per second, go ahead and take that link and sh shift that one AS to that, um, to that link. And then watch how much bandwidth gets sent over it. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a, a poor, poor man's uh, r really manual flow-based data. I've had to use that technique many times, and it's been very effective. Um, so, uh, yeah. Those backup links are good for something. And you know, if you run them only during your peak period of time for an hour or two, you're not going to run into overages or billing. Um, <clears throat> our final sequence of events is some fine tuning. Uh, again, rarely, rarely have to go here. Uh, but uh, you know, let's talk about it. Um, sometimes, maybe due to performance concerns, you're going to have to move some traffic away. Cost concerns, temporary outages, temporary issues. Um, and the tiebreakers, you can't do it with tiebreaker uh, manipulation with metrics. Uh, because maybe there are uh, longer paths. So um, go ahead, identify those longer paths. Uh, sometimes you can actually get this done by inserting uh, the other ISPs uh, in the path in order to get some, uh, in order to uh, artificially create some prepends. Uh, we've done this a couple times. Um, this is if you want to shaft traffic away from AS2, just add AS2 once or twice or three times. Um, I don't like it that much. Uh, it's, it's it's an interesting gimmick, but it'll usually burn you uh, uh, more than help you. Um, because the concept of shifting traffic away is a little bit less hard, is a little harder to follow than the concept of forcing traffic to. So when all this fails with these softer metrics, um, go to local pref, increase that value, force that traffic out that link. Um, sometimes you're gonna have to do this, uh, you know, again to fix your your cost balancing. Uh, show an example here. Um, going to uh, uh, 1004. Obviously, with metrics alone, the best you can do is balance it between one and two. No matter how hard you try, you can never set a metric to force this to, th to three. Uh, for whatever reason, let's say AS1 and 2 are either congesting, not behaving well, full, who knows, you want to send that uh, 1004 out AS3, the only way you can do it is increase that local pref. So in this case, we all have our base metric set. That's not good enough. We have to increase that local pref to 200, and I'll send that traffic out AS3. Um, uh, another case for local pref, this is kind of a kooky one. Um, let's say uh, going to uh, AS3. Um, uh, again, not really a common uh, situation you want to do this, but uh, uh, let's say you actually want to send this traffic to 1003 out AS1. Well, obviously AS3 is going to be the clear winner and usually is going to be the best path. For whatever reason you want to do this, um, sometimes you might do it to manipulate peers and you might do it to be kind of nasty. Um, but let's say you want to send that traffic at AS3. Well, again, increase that local pref at AS1 and force that one, four, five, three path. It's doable, um, but uh, rarely needed. Um, at this point in time, you've succeeded. You've successfully impl implemented the metric system, and you can go on and polish your routers, polish your GBIX. Um, a couple, uh, 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 once, you've, once you've succeeded, uh, you're going to find your network is pretty well balanced, pretty deterministic. Future maintenance, pretty simple, easy to explain to the new engineers. Um, go ahead and get those monitoring systems going and get those performance alarms going. Uh, get alarms when you're over, over utilization, over 50%, 70% utilization, whatever number is important to you. Get that Gomez keynote alert site type of stuff going from multiple locations and find out when one ISP is misbehaving for you, you might need to shift traffic around. Um, a couple alternates I just wanted to mention, um, uh, someone had uh, brought it before was, um, um, was multipath. So, um, um, mul so with multipath, um, well, multipath uh, allows for um, a more uh, a more of an equal cost, uh, kind of just a fair balance, 50-50, 30 30 some kind of hash-based um, auto, auto magic balance. Um, most uh, most of the hardware allows you to balance if you're connecting to the same exact ISP across two links. Uh, very common uh, way to use it. Uh, when two IS you're connecting to the same exact ISP, every metric is equal, and you just want to share 50-50. Um, um, some of them actually offer what's called multipath multi-AS. Um, which is interesting. Uh, it, you need to be careful to make sure you're not introducing uh, any loops.
But it's a, another neat trick. I have a link to AS1 and AS2, and I just want to send 50% of my traffic uh, out both. Uh, at that point in time, you pretty much disregard most of the BGP uh, decision-making uh, 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 tree, um, or at least you take all the tiebreakers and you just 50-50 them. Um, I would say with the multipath multi S, if you're already going to do that, just get quad zeros. You really don't need the full table, honestly. Because what ends up happening is uh, you're only going to multipath the tiebreakers at the bottom, and you might not be satisfied with the result. Um, go ahead and check your documentation with the multipath multi AS or multipath in general. Um, some, sometimes it'll be uh, per flow, sometimes it'll be per prefix. Um, so some prefixes are hashed here, and some prefixes are hashed here. That is a lot less precise then this five tuple flow is hashed here, this five tuple flow is uh, hashed there. Um, not covering it in detail here because again, I found different success in different hardware, different caveats, and, and in, general, um, in general, it's causing me more, more pain than good. The only place I would do multipath is if I have two links to the same exact ISP as I can show you over here. Uh, let's say I have two links to AS1 over here. So maybe my AS2 and 3 were ready for my 10 gig upgrades, and AS1, I gotta wait, they're installing new hardware. So they gave me two 1 gig E's, four 1 gig E's. Uh, and I wanna make it simple, um, and I just wanna say, okay, well, I decided how much traffic's going to AS1, and I just wanna spread it across four links. Well, at that point in time, you turn on simple multipath to AS1, you have two paths with the same exact, um, same exact uh, attributes, metric and local pref, and the router itself, the, the router itself will just do uh, uh, five tuple uh, hash, um, which is fairly accurate with a large enough sample set. Um, again, I have done this um, in a very large network where we had um, where we were doing uh, we needed to take 10 gig e, uh, 20 gig e to ISPs. Well, there's no 20 gig e interface, and there definitely wasn't any affordable 40 gig e solution at the time. So we took, took two 10 gig e's from each ISP. We set our policies, and then we just set multipath, and uh, all the links balanced really nicely. Um, the uh, multipath multi s would be in this situation. So on border two, you may configure multi AS, where you say, well, I have uh, this path to, to 1006 is, of course, uh, equal, all other things being equal, if metrics set uh, to the same value. And I want to go ahead and I want to send half to here and half to there. Um, it's doable. It's, it's interesting. Um, but uh, I wouldn't do it, um, especially since it relies upon, uh, uh, as far as I know, there are only two vendors that do it, and they do it in two different ways. Um, um, uh, I wouldn't want to rely upon it uh, as my sole, uh, my sole technique. Um, common, a couple common errors you need to watch out for. Um, so some issues that are going to result in either an unacceptable balance or something, uh, something that's going to change, a non-determinist that's going to shift um, and you're going to have inconsistencies over time. So one of the common errors is if you're not setting metrics for all routes from the start and you're relying upon those built-in tiebreakers I mentioned earlier, that's why I said the first step is just reset all your metrics and then once you're done, find the good tiebreaker. The other error is not setting unique, unique values. So you may set two, uh, two ASNs to 100 and the other one to 200. Um, well, now you have an error competing. You have, still have a tiebreaker between two out of, out of your three ASNs. Um, and the other one is uh, in conflict, uh, inconsistent metrics that um, are going to have uh, different results um, uh, based on different routers. I'm going to show you that for a moment. Um, a point of some contention here. Um, I believe that all routers, uh, I personally believe that all routers should, ha should be making the same exact egress decision. Uh, some people, uh, their method of load balancing, um, it, uh, they actually, uh, if traffic gets to this border router, you go out the local link, and if traffic goes to that border router, you go out that local link, and they use something lower, uh, uh, lower down in their network to um, balance traffic between the two borders. I don't like that. I, I like every router to have the same exact uh, decision in their head. So here's back to your common error. So let's say you set, uh, you set uh, your metrics here to 50 and 50, um, for this path to AS6, well, of course, which one's going to be selected? It's going to go back to, uh, it's going to go back to, uh, chances are, oldest route heard. And if a session flaps, like I told you before, in AS2, traffic's going to shift to AS3, and you're going to wonder how come your graphs just changed. And you're going to wonder, if you're not watching every, every day, you're going to wonder how come your double billing, your bill just went up higher. Uh, but you didn't necessarily take any more traffic or pull any more revenue in. Um, um, another example um, uh, for... Um, Hold on a second, guys. There we go. Okay. So, oh, uh, I'm, I'm hitting home this word deterministic. If you don't know what it means or the way I'm using it, when I say deterministic, and I'm just going to quote a, a, a dictionary um, definition, having an outcome that can be predicted because all of its causes are either known or the same as those of a previous event, uh, which is kind of the way I explain it. I want to make sure it's always, all things being equal, it's always going to make a decision, and something as arbitrary as a maintenance or a flap uh, isn't going to suddenly change my routing table. Um, when, when the network normalizes. So here's an example of, um, uh, of um, uh, another example of 
of where I say routers have different decision, uh, different opinions. In this model here, if, if the packets from your servers hit border one, he's going to want to go at AS1. And if the packets to the same to the same path, uh, 1004. If packets from your servers hit border two, he's going to go at AS2. Uh, in my experience, I think it's better if both borders actually were to make the same decision. Worst case, if let's say let's say AS1 was selected and the packet hit border two, well, you know that traffic's going to have to traverse uh, an, inter, an interborder link, uh, an interborder link in order to take the path there. Uh, I do think though it's cleaner to have the same exact BGP routing table universally within your island of transit. Um, having different opinions sometimes may be intentional. Um, uh, uh, again, it's, it's a load balancing method that many, uh, um, uh, many enterprises use. Um, again, I, I found it's, it's confusing. I found it consistent. I found that if I do a show IP BGP on one router, I now need to go to the other router and do a show IP BGP there. If you're using, uh, if you're using a, ver a very common situation is where you have, um, I said it here, um, ECMP for server. So um, a very common situation is where you might have servers uh, down here in the path and maybe you have two HSRP or VRP gateways. So half of your servers are taking this path and half are taking that path. And you get a complaint from a customer that the application is somehow not performing well. Well, just based on which server they might hit, they might take this ISP versus that ISP. Um, and uh, you're going to have a hard time troubleshooting and even correcting that. Uh, and that's why I say just stay consistent. Make sure all of your routers make the same exact decisions. Um, uh, the other thing that will happen if you're making, if you have different opinions, well, if one router goes away, you might actually suddenly have um, uh, a shift, an unexpected shift in traffic. Um, so in summary, I like to make the primary decision based on um, AS length um, hop count. Um, let's take advantage of that limited minimal performance information. The only thing we can really get on today's internet, let's go ahead and rely upon it. Um, your basic balance is coming through your tiebreakers. Um, if you need to do a few more broad strokes, uh, maybe some community-based, uh, destination ASN, optionally you might have to do some fine-tuning. Typically, it's secondary and optional steps not really hit. Uh, what you're going to want to try to do is try to minimize those tuning steps because the more policy, the more tuning, the harder it's going to be to maintain. Um, any questions? This, is the, this cat decides to go that way and that cat decides to go that way, so it's his decision-making process. Comments? No. Yeah. No. This is EBG. This is EBGP load balancing. So yeah. Yeah, that, that, so, that, so that, that, that doesn't happen on, on the networks I run. That, that doesn't occur. The, 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 decision, the same decision is made on every single BGP speaker in, within that ASA, in, in my world. Um, that, doesn't, that doesn't end up happening, yeah. Yeah, so that, that, that happens outside of BGP, absolutely. Yeah. Um, if you're doing it on IGP level or MPLS level um, or static routes to loop back kind of thing, ECMP level. Um, so thank you for your time. Peak Web Consulting is available to help if you do have networks that need assistance or if you need some additional work with us or if you know someone who needs it. Um, my email address is at the bottom here. It's been unspamified. Not that that's really good anymore, but uh, feel free to contact me uh, at email or find me around the conference or GPF or next time around at Pittsburgh. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much.